the wave particle duality of light, and the photoelectric effect. All right, so the big question, is light a particle or a wave? And scientists have been arguing about this since ancient times. So there has been a long-standing dispute. There had been. And in the early 1700s, two camps existed regarding the nature of light. On one side was Huygens' camp, which argued that light was a wave. Sir Isaac Newton's argued for the corpuscular or little particles theory of light. Now, in the early 1800s, Young performed something called the double slit diffraction experiment. And so he passed light through two slits, which then diffracted the light as it passed through. And a characteristic interference pattern is observed. So remember, we talked about the superposition principle. And here, these bright lines, these are constructive interference. And this, these lines where it's darker, those are uh, destructive interference. So if we were to look along this edge and perhaps record this light hitting, you know, with some sort of film, we would have bright, 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 and then dark and dark lines, okay, in between. And that's a characteristic interference pattern for a double slit diffraction. Now, after Young's experiment, it appeared that the particle theory of light was vanquished. And then Einstein started doing experiments with the photoelectric effect in the early 1900s. And his experiments demonstrated that light behaves as a particle. So how does the photoelectric effect work? Well, the overall experiment involves light of some wattage and wavelength, and remember wavelength is related to the energy of the light, and you shine it on a metal surface. And now, one thing I haven't shown is that I'm showing this as kind of a light bulb, as a, it, as a cartoon, but really it would be a laser, okay, of a certain wavelength or range of wavelengths that hit this metal surface, and then all of this area would be enclosed in an evacuated tube. Now, if the light coming from this light source has enough energy, then it will eject an electron. And the electron will travel from the surface with some velocity. Now, after these series of experiments, Einstein proposed that light is composed of photons. And photons are basically discrete little packets of energy. And the energy of a photon is related to either its frequency or its wavelength. And both these equations involve Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. And then also, in the case of the wavelength, that we want to calculate the energy of a photon in terms of wavelength, we would also need the speed of light, which we've already discussed. Now, how do we know if electrons are going to be ejected or not? And it's going to depend on something called the work function of the metal. And we symbolize it with a phi. Okay? And basically, if the light is energetic enough to overcome that work function, then electrons will be ejected. And they'll have some kinetic energy as they leave the surface. So, an equation to show this, here's the kinetic energy of the ejected electrons, here's the energy of the photon in terms of wavelength in this case, minus this binding energy that has to be overcome for the electrons to be ejected. And then here is the equation also in terms of energy of the photon in terms of frequency with the same work function. Okay, so basically, work, the work function of a metal is the binding energy. So it's kind of similar to that. So how tightly is that electron held to that metal? And, very, and metals have characteristic work functions. So aluminum, here are a few examples just compiled. So aluminum, beryllium, mercury, calcium, platinum, and you can see these various work functions.
And this is the amount of energy that you have to overcome in order to eject an electron from the metal surface. So the photon has to have more energy than the work function in order for an electron to be ejected. All right, so one more extension. And so remember our equation for the kinetic energy, okay? Now if we substitute this in for EK in our photoelectric equation, then we can relate the velocity the, that the electron is ejected with to the energy of the photon minus the work function. So here's our kinetic energy, and now we'd be able to predict the velocity that the electron leaves the surface with. Now, how do we know the longest wavelength or the lowest frequency that would eject an electron from a metal surface? And basically, we get that by setting this kinetic energy equal to zero. Okay, so in other words, we can get the least amount of energy necessary to dislodge one of these electrons and overcome that binding energy if we say that it leaves with zero kinetic energy. And so these two quantities, so this is the threshold wavelength, the longest wavelength that can eject electrons, and this is the threshold frequency, which is the lowest frequency that will eject electrons from a given metal. And so basically, to determine this threshold frequency or wavelength, you set the kinetic energy equal to zero and then plug in the work function and solve for the wavelength or the frequency, depending on what your, how your problem is set up. Now, there are a few more observations that Einstein made with the photoelectric effect. And he demonstrated that light interacts with matter as a particle by ejecting electrons. And in our calculations, we can assume that one photon ejects one electron. Now, he found that a dim light, so a really dim light source, with a wavelength shorter than the threshold wavelength will eject electrons. So that means that the, if the wavelength is shorter than the threshold wavelength, that means that photon has more energy than the work function. So even if it's a really dim light, it will still eject electrons. Now, on the other hand, if the light doesn't have enough energy to overcome the work function of a particular metal, then it doesn't matter how bright we make that light, no electrons are ejected. Now, again, this is important to keep in mind. Remember, the energy of a photon is related to its wavelength or its frequency. And so I like to label this with E photon, just to remind that this is the energy of one photon in terms of frequency, or the energy of one photon in terms of wavelength. Okay, so let's calculate the energy in joules of a photon with a wavelength of 595 nanometers. And we're given the constants here, and then also I've provided this conversion from meters to nanometers, but you do need to memorize that conversion. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is convert our light wavelength from nanometers to meters because we cannot plug in nanometers in for the wavelength to get the energy of a photon. We've got to cancel out our units and the speed of light is in meters per second, so we have to convert to meters. All right, so doing the conversion, we end up with 5.95 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Okay, plug that in and then put everything in the calculator, and we end up with 3.34 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So the energy of this photon is a discrete packet that has 3.34 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Now, I'm going to post a lot of calculation examples for the photoelectric effect, and they will be posted separately. Okay, so in summary, Young's double slit diffraction experiment demonstrated that light behaves as a wave. Now Einstein's photoelectric effect experiment showed that light behaves as a particle. And so we can see that light can behave either way depending on the situation.
Einstein also showed that photons are little packets of energy that can interact with matter as a particle. The energy of a photon is related to its wavelength or its frequency, so the shorter the wavelength of the photon, the higher the energy. The higher the frequency of the photon, the higher the energy. So in the photoelectric effect, photons must have enough energy to overcome the work functions. They have to have a short enough wavelength or a high enough frequency to make the energy of that photon more than the work function of the metal. And any excess energy, so if the photon has more energy than the work function, then that extra energy is carried off in the form of kinetic energy with the ejected electron. And with that kinetic energy, we can plug in the mass of an electron and we can calculate the velocity that that ejected electron leaves the surface with.